This over here is the test bench for the Intel Xeon 3475X. It's got hefty amount of cores and it's got a hefty price point. And it's one of the weirdest CPUs I have ever tested on this channel. Now this is Intel's answer to the Threadripper Pro from AMD. There are some features in here that are better than the Threadripper Pro. But the question is, is it still better than the Threadripper Pro? Well, we're gonna find out. And another thing we're gonna find out is the sponsor of this video. Looking for a cheap way to license your windows? Check out WhoKeys through the links in the video description. Make sure to use the code TN20 to get a 30% off. Paste the license to the activation settings and you're all done. This license is for Windows 10, but you can upgrade it to Windows 11 for free. They also offer Microsoft Office 19 license. Use the same code TN20 to get a 30% off. Check out WhoKeys.com in the video description below. Now, one of the main reasons I don't have the CPU on my hand, but it's still in the test bench is because the second part of benchmarking to do because unlike Threadripper Pro CPUs this Intel Xeon is actually unlocked which means it can be overclocked and actually quite easy to overclocked you can go to XU Intel software just click one speed optimizer and boom your processor suddenly is much more powerful. So if you're interested in seeing 36 cores from Intel Xeon overclocked and what the performance is like then stick around for that one. First of all, let's have a look at the specs to understand what is this CPU, where does it come from, and you know, where does it even line up? So we're gonna be comparing this with the Ryzen 9 7950X, which is the mainstream platform Ryzen, you know, the top end. We're gonna be also comparing it to the 5995WX Threadripper Pro CPU. And I know this is not completely fair comparison, and the much more fairer comparison would be to compare the 56 core, not the 36 core. I should have had the 56 core as well, but um, I don't have it yet. Maybe we can get it in as well to get really head to head comparison. But in this one, we're just gonna be looking at some of the performance because it's still very interesting, I promise you. And then we're gonna be looking at the 13900K from Intel, another mainstream kind of consumer platform high end. And how does these, you know, gaming CPUs compared to this real high-end desktop CPU. First of all, if you look at the actual physical size difference of these CPUs, then this Xeon is massive compared to the 3900K or 7950X. It's more, you know, in the Threadripper line of massive slab of a CPU. So then, looking at the specs, we can see that it's got 36 cores and 72 threads, and these are all performance cores. There's no, you know, efficiency cores going on or anything like that, which Intel's got going on with their like mainstream, you know, 13900K and 12900K and these CPUs. But the interesting thing is Intel has still approached a little bit of a Threadripper kind of way of building these CPUs because these CPUs consist of four separate dies. So there's kind of like a pr four separate CPUs glued together and then they all perform together to give us um, 36 cores, which is interesting, which is kind of nine cores per die interesting this lineup of cpus maxes out at 56 cores and not 64 we can't quite get the same core count as amd so amd is leading in that department in terms of max turbo frequency we've got 4.8 gigahertz and compared to the 5995wx which is only 4.5 gigahertz the max pcie generation is gen 5 and that's the amazing things in terms of pcie lanes from the CPU, we've got 112 PCIe Gen 5 lanes. In terms of bandwidth compared to the Threadripper, it's just so much more. Pretty much 2x the bandwidth of what we get from Threadripper Pro PCIe bandwidth from the CPU, which is just ridiculous. Now, it's not exactly twice because PCIe Gen 5 and Gen 4 have twice the bandwidth, basically. So whatever you have on Gen 4, PCI Gen 5 has double that, but the PCI lanes from the CPU are slightly lower compared to the Threadripper. The Threadripper has 128 lanes PCI Gen 4 compared to the 112 Gen 5 on the, this one. But regardless, there's nothing like that on the market yet because AMD hasn't updated their Threadripper Pro lineup and in terms of PCA lane coverage, this is Ian is the top of the bunch. And RAM compatibility, this CPU supports, just pause for an effect, four terabytes of DDR5 memory. 
four terabytes. That's that's ridiculous. Let's just say that it's so much that if you filled it up, you probably could run your OS and your programs and your projects straight from RAM, which is ridiculous. It's got an eight channel memory IMC there. The L3 cache is 82.5 megabytes per second, Intel's smart cache technology, which is quite a bit lower than the 5995WX, but AMD has always had a lot more cache than Intel. L2 cache is 36 megabytes, which is slightly more than what AMD has there. The base power is 300 watts. That, that's the base where it starts at, but it goes a little bit more than that. The max power, what Intel rates it, is 360 watts. But when enabling multi-core enhancement from the BIOS and just letting the BIOS say, look, if you if you want to go a little bit higher, just just go, you know, it's all right if you if you want to do that. Uh, then it pulls 406 watts from the socket. 406, which is a lot higher than 13900K and even more higher than the Threadripper Pro, which is just ridiculous. It doesn't have an integrated graphics and the process node is the same as the 12th gen and 13th gen. It's the 10 nanometer process, which Intel calls Intel 7. And the price for this bad fella is about $4,000. <coughs> Woo! It's a lot of cash. Show me the money. <laughs> now let's look at the benchmarks now, but first I want to talk about the test bench setup because it's a lot different than what we usually have here as well. First of all, we're going to be testing this on the ASUS WS Pro W790E Sage SC motherboard, which is a killer motherboard, and we're using 128 gigabytes of DDR5 Kingston Fury RAM. Now, thanks Kingston for sending out two 64 gigabyte kits, because I think I'm one of the only people in the world who is testing this platform on eight channel memory. If you look at the, some of the other reviews that are already out there, you notice that they're only using quad channel kits. So they only have four DDR5 RDIMMs. By the way, this is RDIMMs, not just usual DDR5. You need a special DDR5 to put in there because of the ECC and because it actually operates at 12 volts rather than five volts. So it's a completely different type of thing what's going on there. Interestingly, even though the IMC is rated at 4,800 megatransfers per second, we're gonna talk about that in a moment, the RAM that I'm using is 6,000 megatransfers per second, and I had absolutely no problem running it. The IMC is absolutely incredible to run the RAM just 6,000 MTS. The GPU is the trusted ASUS 240X 3090, and for the cooler, we're using this Enemax Liquitech 360TR42 cooler. And what's so different about this cooler is that there are not a lot of AIOs for the Threadripper and Xeon platform, which basically means that the actual area it cools is a lot bigger than the usual just mainstream uh, AIOs. Now, it could work on both of them, but you actually get much better performance for the cooler when your actual AIO or some of the air cooling as well, you can see Noctua TR4 NHU14S coolers, they have a big, 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 big cooler plate there, which just helps to soak the heat up. And this cooler is doing incredible, incredible job. For OS SSD, I'm using Sabre Rocket 4.0 one terabyte SSD. And for the project SSD, I'm using two terabyte Seagate Fire CUDA 513. And for PSU, we need something a bit more juicier and higher end because it pulls a lot of power. We're using the MSI AI 1300P power supply, which is a 1300 watt power supply, platinum rated, very high end power supply as well. I'll leave all the tech in the description below if you want to check it out, as well as the Ryzen 7000 platform and Intel's 12th and 13th gen platform test bench setup. Now, memory controller, IMC, as far as I can tell from looking at the specs online, because this is not what's often talked about, but I find it so important for creators to see how good is the IMC and what RAM is actually supported and how far can we push the IMC. Now, the 13900K is rated 5600 mega transfers per second, which is like the second generation IMC uh, for the DDR5. Ryzen 7000 supports up to 5200 mega transfers per second, which is slightly higher than the 12th gen, which was 4800. And that's what we can see here on this 
fourth gen Xeons, which is 4,800 mega transfers per second. But because it's an eight channel memory, it can easily run it much higher because they're not splitting the channels like on a mainstream if you want to have like 128 gigabytes for example you're already splitting the memory controller because it's only a dual channel memory on 3900k for example but because each dim is a direct channel to the cpu it has or to the integrated memory controller which means it it's easier to push them past 4800 and interestingly for my review kit they sent the 6000 mega transfers per second kit which just runs absolutely no problem now i've got to mention also that intel specs does say that when you run four terabytes of ddr5 the integrated memory controller actually slows down a little bit because it can't keep up with the capacity and it starts to run at 4400 mega transfers per second but no one has a four terabyte ddr5 rdim kit at the moment i believe only in the intel labs i believe as uh, so i can't test that in terms of power consumption the 3900k pulls 340 watts and the 5995wx threadripper pulls 286 watts whereas this guy over here at 100% utilization in Cinebench R23, as you can see, is pulling 406 watts. Yes, that's over 400 watts. And you're wondering, goodness me, is this cooler actually able to keep up with it? And the answer is absolutely no problem. And here's where this big like power consumption is completely different on this larger IHS CPUs because it's much higher the heat is spread out as well the dyes are actually laid out they're, they're not the, the hotspot is not like one small hotspot so in the middle of the CPU like we have on the 13900k as you can see the 13900k is thermal throttling even like 300 watts and really there's no AIO in the market that can really fully 100% cool it down without thermal throttling but this AIO, it's still 360 millimeter AIO, is keeping the CPU under 70 degrees. In fact, if you just run it with good airflow and your room is not higher than like 21 degrees, I can't get it past 60, deg 60 degrees. It's absolutely no problem in terms of the actual thermal throttling and managing the heat. If you want to see this CPU air cooled at 500 watts perhaps, then stick around to that. So yes, it is pulling a lot more power than Threadripper, but in terms of the heat, it's kept under control. Looking at Cinebench R23 now, the 3475X scores 1716 points in the single core score, which is about 20% slower than the 13900K. So the 4.8 gigahertz is not giving a good single core performance, but it's still a lot higher than the Threadripper Pro, as you can see. In terms of multi-core performance, it's 26.9% higher than the 13900K, but it's also pulling a lot more wattage as well. Just did a quick calculation here in terms of performance per watt interestingly 3900k pulling 315 watts to score like 40,000 points in cinebench is actually higher performance per watt than this xeon so those efficiency cores actually are quite a quite a good thing in geekbench 5 the 3475x is the fastest multi-core cpu i have ever tested in geekbench 5 and it's 35.9% faster than the 13900K and faster than the 7950X as well. In single core performance, we're about 27% slower. We're faster than the 5995WX and we're actually faster in multi-core performance as well, as you can see. Now actual creator application benchmarks. And I wanna take a quick moment here and mention the benchmarking situation that was going on here because I had to do a lot of benchmarking in this one because this CPU kind of scored two separate ballparks for the benchmarks. I had like the lower score and then the higher score and pretty much half of the time it was benchmarking there or there. When it was low, it was like really low, like last gen i5 territory or sometimes Ryzen 5600X territory, like, whoa, what the heck is going on that low? And then when it was scoring high, you were like, whoa, it is very high as well. So it's kind of hard to figure out like which one is this. I do think I'm gonna favor the higher ones there and that's what I'm talking about here. But trying to figure out what caused the situation or why was it scoring so high and so low, 
it wasn't so easy. I think it's because of the power management and the software and the way Windows Scheduler works. It's not able to wake all the cores up because sometimes my PC would go to sleep, for example, and I would wake it up and start benchmarking again. And I'm like, goodness me, the benchmarks are all so slow. Or sometimes I'm turning it off and turning it back on, the benchmarks are slow. I restart the system and it kind of refreshes everything, starts from, you know, scratch and then it scores very, very high again. So there's some kind of, which just makes me think, there is some kind of an issue with waking up the cores and what's going on there. But the benchmarks you see here are the best case scenario, basically, when everything's working properly, this is where it is. But it is a brand new platform, so we can expect some of these kind of issues there. In Blender, the 3475X is 30 to 77% faster in Monster, Junk Shop and Classroom scenes. That is a lot higher and that's where you can see what this CPU is actually meant for. If you're looking for high core count, insane CPU rendering, multi-core performance CPU for, ex for the likes of uh, Blender here you can see, it is a lot, a lot faster than what you can see on the mainstream. Still not quite as fast as the 5995WX, which in monster scenes is getting close to double the performance. But yet again, in classroom scene, we're a lot more closer than in monster scene. Moving on to Photoshop, and this is where things started going bad very, very quickly. Now this 3475X is 32 to 55% slower than the 13900K. Now, this 1098 score is the high score that it gets. I had to do a lot of restarting and doing again because the first scores that I got were less than 700 points, 697 points. Now, that, that's lower than the lowest of the lowest. Mac Mini M1 with 16 gigabytes, pretty much. It's it's lower than laptops, is it's slower than anything, but I think some of the cores were asleep and it wasn't able to tube boost the right cores maybe or something like that because it's got 36 cores and only two of those will go to 4.8 if I'm not mistaken. But still, at 1098, this is pretty much the Ryzen 5600X performance. So for Photoshop, I wouldn't get that CPU. In Lightroom Classic, things are a lot different. When I'm getting high scores, these high scores are like very, very high. Like it absolutely whoops even the 5995WX, even at the multi-core or passive scores basically, and active scores as well, which is just insane. We're getting a score of 1,843, which is only 4.4% slower than the 13900K, which is the fastest CPU I've tested for Lightroom Classic, which just shows this is very, very good. But at the same time, some of the lower scores are also 1,100 points, which just marks it right and down there. So if you're working in Lightroom, it can be very, very good, but I just restart the PC before actually starting this. And very importantly, update the BIOS. I actually had to ask ASUS support to give me a new BIOS because I saw in Puget Bench systems, there was guys benchmarking with this same CPU with a much newer BIOS than what I had and what ASUS had available on the website. So I knew this was somehow available there and the performance was much different and much higher with the newer BIOS. So if you can update the BIOS, because the newer BIOS didn't just save me the wattage on what, how much I was pulling from the socket, but also gave me a better and higher multi-core performance. Moving on to video editing and Premiere Pro, we are uh, quite a bit slower than any of these comparisons here. 3900K were about 23 to 27% slower in standard live playback, 38% slower, obviously, because we don't have an iGPU there. Now, another thing I want to say is that this Xeon would be amazing if it did have an iGPU there as well. Just Intel, please, just add a tiny little bit of the iGPU UHD 770. It would be amazing. Integrated graphics for that. Now, this 1165 extended over a score is, is not really impressive. Like, I'm seeing the 11900K even is faster, and 12600K is faster. So, it's not quite impressive. Now, yes, the export score is, is impressive, but other than that, it's, it's not really good. But you can see that the effect score is slightly faster than the 5995WX. So for video editing, I'd kind of skip the CPU as well. In After Effects, very similar kind of result here. About 28 to 40% slower on the multi-core performance 
which is just interesting. Now, After Effects recently updated its system and basically uh, introduced multi-core performance. It was very single-threaded at first, but now it can actually render some of these frames, like, not sequentially, but all, like, different places at the same time and utilize multi-core performance. But you can see the multi-core performance compared to the 13900K, which has a lot less cores, is 40% slower. There are, either the software isn't supporting this Xeon 4th gen yet, or something is going on there. We've got much faster RAM, we've got a lot more RAM, we've got more cores, faster multi-core performance, but with performance lower in After Effects. So for even After Effects, I'd probably skip the CPU and even go with the Threadripper Pro. As you can see, Threadripper Pro performs better, but still worse than the 13900K. That just shows how good the 13900K, for example, and 7950X are the mainstream CPUs. In DaVinci Resolve, Again, things are slightly different. The Winter Resolve seems to be supporting the latest software always a bit better. The 3475X is only 7 to 10% slower compared to the 13900K. But interestingly, the 4K media score and 8K media score is faster than the 13900K. And that's just because of the multi-core performance. We can push through some of the codecs much better and playback and so on. But in Fusion, we are quite a bit slower than the 13900K and actually slower than the 5995WX, which kind of doesn't make sense for me because I thought Fusion is more single core performance, which just makes me think the CPU and the platform is still not fully communicating with the software because we're not getting the high clock speeds because the clock speed should be much higher than the 5995WX. So I'd assume that the Fusion score should be a bit higher than the 5995WX. But still, I wouldn't really get this CPU for the video editing just because we can get similar performance from the 13900K, which would be much cheaper. But then to end on a little bit of a positive note, the V-Ray performance is again incredible. As you can see, we are 49% faster than the 13900K. Not quite as fast as the 5995WX, but still very, very impressive. Now, before I'm gonna give you the conclusion of this, I wanna mention one more thing, the overclocking. And this is something that I'm gonna make a separate video about just because I don't think for creators overclocking is recommended because you lose the stability for your system and it pulls more wattage and it can, you know, reduce the lifespan of your CPU. But then at the same time, why does e Intel even give you the option of overclocking these CPUs? It just shows that they have left a little bit of a performance on the table. They could have clocked them a bit higher and say, that's it, you can't touch any of the voltage. All motherboard, you know, manufacturers, they, that's the voltage we're gonna be running at. And that's, that's it, you know, basically. But there is quite a bit of performance on the table. For example, first time when I put the speed optimizer on, I saw over 500 watts pulled from the socket and I was like, like, whoa. And when I do put the speed optimizer on, I have found that the whole system was much more snappy and much more responsive. And I was instantly like, whoa, is this a different system? So Intel does want you to kind of do that. And interestingly, even though I don't have the 56 core version of this Xeon, but the 56 core Xeon, when speed optimized, it's pulling over 700 watts, but it's actually beating the Ryzen 5995WX Threadripper Pro CPU in multi-core performance, which is just insane performance. But since it does use chiplets and it's a Xeon much higher core count CPU, the actual power consumption at idle is a lot higher as well. Now we're not idling at 20 watts, 30 watts, 40 watts, 50, 60. We're hun idling probably around 100 watts. I think the lowest I saw somewhere was around 90 watts or something like that. The earlier bi version of BIOS was idling at 150 watts and I was thinking, goodness me, this is higher than some of these CPUs at 100% utilization. So that just shows it's a completely different system. And when using chiplet design, you can't be as energy efficient as monolith monolithic design of the CPU. But in conclusion, I think it's very interesting because finally we have some competition for the Threadripper because AMD has been pushing this one road for a long time. As you can see, Threadripper Pro 5995WX was released quite a while ago. They, we don't know when the new one's gonna come out. I think Intel's gonna be in trouble when this is gonna come out, but it's still nice to see Intel beating the high-end desktop CPUs to DDR5 
faster and the IMC is better. So we're going to see what I am the um, what thread repair will do. But so far I'm kind of not impressed with it. Now this might be particularly because of my workflow and I don't see myself actually ut utilizing this or using this because I, I don't see any use for this CPU really for my workflow. But at the same time, I've got to consider other people who might use different workflows. So for example, if you're using Handbrake or Blender or V-Ray or some of these softwares that utilize all of the cores and you need a lot of memory, a lot of fast memory, like at 3D animation, for example, when you're running out of VRAM and you just can't render them anymore on GPU and you might have to render them on CPU, then this platform stands kind of on its own and there's no competition there because of the RAM support, the bandwidth that th this platform supports for the DDR5 is just absolutely ridiculous. So it's impressive on that point. To me, it sounds slightly desperate from Intel's side to push that much wattage through the CPU to compete with AMD. But then at the same time, at that point, I'm not sure this is even a problem because it's not thermal throttling and we're not pushing it to TJ Max at all. So it's kind of a middle ground there and I'm not sure where to stand in this. Is it good? Yeah, in some ways it's good for me, not really. What do you think? I'd love to know your opinion on this. Like, would, you, would this benefit you in your workflow? Would you consider doing this? And if so, please let me know uh, how would you use this and why this would be very good for you or very bad for you. I'd, I'll meet you in the comment section below. But if you do want to build yourself the best bank for what creator PC that's a lot cheaper and very much affordable and actually gives you better performance, then check out the video description below. There's build guides in there, four videos, pick the one that's close to your budget and you'll get the best PC you can build as a creator and save a ton of cash. Check them out down below. I'll explain everything down there. Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.